We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power coming to you on a gray day here in Tbilisi, Georgia. And what we're going to do today is another anecdotes episode. And I decided let's do something different. I have been doing things um, about people, but let's talk about animals. Now, I could do this and shall we say, open it up to all the animals uh, in my life, but that would be a bit large. And there have been animals here in the country of Georgia. There have been animals in California where I grew up. There were rats and cockroaches in New York City. Um, and, and I hear a dog barking off in the distance. But we're going to specify, I lived 22 years in Alaska in a small rural town called Haines. And we're going to limit our access to just the Alaskan animals. And as you can probably guess, uh, Alaskan animals are legendary. So what I want to do is rather than just kind of do these alphabetically, which is no organization at all, uh, we're going to do this by size. I'm going to start with the smallest uh, animal or type of animal or species of animal and go to the largest that I encountered. Now we're only going to limit this to 10 animals or types of animals. Uh, I could have included a lot more. Unfortunately the porcupine is not going to show up here, although I do have a couple of interesting experiences with the porcupine and the wolverine. And I mean, there's quite a few animals I could have included here, uh, hummingbirds and uh, uh, magpies and all sorts of things. But I am going to limit it to 10 categories of animals or 10 animals. And the first one is the hooligan, uh, also known as the ulagan or the ulakan, which is a small fish that uh, resides in the Pacific Northwest from uh, Canada up into Alaska, maybe down in Washington State, I'm not sure. But it's about this long, about a foot long. And it runs in the millions. But we have a very special relationship to it where we live in Haines, Alaska. By the way, I am covering only my experiences in my area. I will occasionally tell stories of other people that I know that I've heard stories from, but I will not just go randomly creating stories. You know, I could do research and pull out, say, dozens of their stories that I've read in books. Um, there's a couple really frightening ones that I've read in books. But I'm going by either my experiences or someone who has told me of something they really know about. I hope <laughs> that it's not just tall tales. Um, but in the Haines area, there are two valleys. There is the Chilkat Valley, where the Chilkat River runs. And then there is the uh, Chilkoot Valley, where the Chilkoot uh, river runs, which is a much smaller river, and there is also the Chilkoot Lake. There are Native Americans, uh, the Clinkett Indians, and who live in that area, and they're roughly divided into two different uh, smaller tribes or clans, and that's the Chilkoots and the Chilkats. Chilkat is a word which basically means something like basket or container of many fish. And chilkoot is a word which means container of big fish. Uh, there's not much difference between the two, but we'll talk more about that when we get to one of our other animals. But we're doing the smallest one right now. And this is the hooligan fish is extremely important to the clinkets. It is the sign that 
spring has come. Uh, that, and by spring, I mean, well, really summer. It comes usually in April, late April or early May, and they run by the millions. Now, the, uh, we call it the hooligan fish, the clinkets. Now, hooligan is our local name. Some people there will go like hooligan or they'll use hooligan or whatever. And I'm like, nah, hooligan. And I like hooligan. They hooligan little rascals in the water. Um, but the Clinkets call them Sa'ak. That's their word. They run by the millions, as you can see by the photo here that I took. Um, and what you do when they come, well, first of all, as they're running, the rest of the animal kingdom is following them because they are such a tasty, oily meal. Uh, so one of the things that follows them is the bald eagle and the seagull follows them in from, they are an anadromous fish. They live in the ocean, but they come and spawn up the rivers in the freshwater. So that is the definition of an anadromous fish. Salmon are also anadromous. We will be talking about them. Spoiler alert. Uh, although if you spoil salmon too much, it does, they do stink as do the uh, hooligan. Uh, sometimes they're called candlefish, although there's another species, the sablefish, which is really the candlefish. But they're called that because they have so much grease and oil in them that when they're dried, you could literally light, put their uh, head, uh, their dried head, on, in some sort of container and light the tail and it would create a candle. It is the oil, or what's called the grease, that is the central feature of these small fish. Like I said, not only are the, uh, the birds coming up after them, but more importantly, the stellar sea lions are following them as well. Now, stellar sea lions are massive creatures. Uh, a bull stellar sea lion can be 11 feet over 3 meters long and weigh 2,500 pounds or about 1200 kilos incredibly large creatures but the bulls generally don't come up after them the bulls have other fish to fry shall we say where does that expression come from fish to fry anyway the bulls have other fish to fry but the 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 cows the females follow up after them and they will hang out in the water for a long time in that area and so you can just drive up and see plenty of sea lions. We'll talk more about sea lions later. But what the uh, clinkets would do is they would go out and they would take these dip nets. Now, they used to make them out of uh, a kind of a weaving uh, bark net, and they would put them in the water, kind of strain them out. We today use, of course, uh, more of a nylon uh, meshed net, and you have to make sure it's got holes big enough that, or small enough that the, the fish don't slide through. But you, you take a couple of scoops of them, or several scoops, and the clinkets go down and get, you know, thousands of them. Like I say, they run in the millions. So it's not like thousands is going to hurt anybody. Plus they're on their way to die, spawn and die. And, uh, but what, uh, I, I went out. I, only a couple of times um, to dip net. I didn't get into it till near the end of my time there. And I, what I discovered is like three full dips of my net was enough to last me the summer because they're so oily. Even if I had 50 fish of these little fish or, or more, you couldn't eat more than three of them at a time. Now, I would fry them up. There were people there who smoked them. They were so tasty and addictive. But if you ate too many, you'd get what I call oil head, whereas you're just like, mm. But the great thing is, it is the right oil. It's omega-3 fish oil. And what the Clinkets would do is they would dig a hole in the ground, and they would... Uh, Put all the, uh, they had specific sites along, you see them still along the Haynes Highway, little houses there. But they would, they would uh, take their uh, hooligan and dump them in to a pile, a big, huge pile, and then let the pile rot. <laughs> let, it, let it age, let the uh, fish uh, kind of start to stink a little bit. They put them in a pot with water, boil them skim off the oil, and then you would have hooligan oil. 
And that hooligan oil traditionally was a very, very important trade commodity for the Clinkets. Now, the Clinkets were perhaps the richest tribe among the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest Indians, ranging all the way down to the Puget Sound, all the way up to uh, where we were and further along the coast. Uh, they were very powerful. They had a lot of fish. And having all five species of salmon at their doorstep, literally, meant by October they'd pretty much got enough fish for the whole year. And they would start to smoke them or freeze them. And um, they would also continue catching them into the winter. And I'll explain why in a moment. But they would create this hooligan oil, which, as you can probably guess, was not... Um, uh, didn't particularly taste, uh, it was an acquired taste, shall we say, a very acquired taste. A good friend of mine, Tom Lang, recalls his experience. Now, I never actually ate hooligan oil. And uh, like I said, the, 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 the reason for it was as a trade commodity because it was extraordinarily nutritious, especially uh, for the winter, as they were going into the winter, it had the, exactly the vitamins you would need to make it through a winter, plus that fish oil. And they would go and trade specifically with the Athabascans up north in what is now the Yukon Territories and some of the other tribes there. And uh, in exchange for the things they might have, like furs and uh, other uh, uh, traditional uh, substances and, and uh, trade items. But uh, Tom Lang told me that uh, he was once invited to a Clinka dinner. It's, it's, it's quite an honor to get invited to like a traditional kind of ceremonial Clinka dinner. I never had that experience. In 22 years, never, never had that. But he said, uh, and now what the hooligan oil was used for is you didn't just drink it, but rather it was sitting there in a little container and you would dip your smoked salmon into it. So it was like a condiment. And so he tried some. Now, he says that, speaking of acquired taste, the taste was horrendous. <laughs> just absolutely, ugh. But they looked at the, him and they were all like, you know, smiling. Well, what did you think? <laughs> he realized... He shouldn't tell them exactly what, how bad it tasted to him. So he, uh, he says, being a, he was raised partly in the South, he says, being a good Southern boy, he said, I realized I had to, you know, say something complimentary. So he said, that was the best hooligan oil I've ever had. Of course, it was the only hooligan oil he ever had to add. That would make it the worst as well. So, uh, and of course, everyone was like, thank you, thank you. And my Clinket friends later did tell me, it's just like, yeah, that was the right reaction because you didn't want to turn your nose up at the hooligan oil. Next, so like I said, we're increasing in size. The next would be, let's just call them the Corvids. And that, particularly the, uh, the Ravens and the Crows. And Ravens and Crows are extraordinarily intelligent, with ravens being much larger and much more intelligent. Uh, the crows were about this long, from tail to beak. The ravens were like this, much bigger. And they also had very, very different habits. Uh, the crows were much more communal organization, shall we call them? I mean, they literally... In looking for food, I I had a little roof on a fire shed next to the, my back door of my house. And I would take the uh, scraps of food I had, like scraps of bread or bones or whatever, and throw it on top of this uh, shed. And the ravens were always there within a few seconds. How did that happen? It's because they were so organized that if you looked at the uh, telephone poles all around the, uh, the the town of Haynes, you would see a raven uh, on one over here, and a raven on one over there, and another one over there, and another one over there. And as soon as any of them would see something that looked like food action, they would go, ah! <laughs> and suddenly, vroom, they would all 
appear. Now, the funny thing about that is that um, <laughs> uh, sometimes I would just throw out one piece of food onto this roof and then a crow would come. Great. Take it and go. No, nope. he go Grah! and then kind of stupidly let it sit there and then all the other crows would come and a bigger one would come take it away and I was just like okay maybe you're not that intelligent but no this has to do with survival and the crows to survive they survive a mass they they survive uh, by these rules they have for how they find food and they don't find food individually they find food collectively now I had a huge Sitka spruce tree that kind of literally hung over my house. I, I sometimes worried about it. I, it is gone now, unfortunately, because the people who ended up buying that house leveled the whole thing. But I'm not going to get into that story. But uh, they had at least one, maybe two nests in that spruce tree. So I could always hear, I would hear when the young chicks were born. I would notice when the crows were gathering uh, material for their nests. I could see where the nests were if I went out and looked up that tree. Uh, and now one of the problems with these nests is that they were also, they had to kind of hide them in a certain way so that other predators didn't see them. And the two main predators that would go after these nests was, one would be the bald eagles, spoiler alert, bald eagles coming up, and the other would be the ravens. Now the ravens are much more solitary creatures. They do hang out in small groups, they're like little uh, street gangs now and then. But they don't hang out in the large flocks that the crows do. And when a raven would come into the area, those same uh, sentinels on each totem, uh, telephone pole, and sometimes totem poles, would be squawking, and suddenly they would all come and attack the raven. Now, that worked quite well with the ravens to keep them off, although occasionally the ravens would sneak in there because the ravens are much more intelligent and did find ways. And because they, they operate more in a solo manner, they found ways of slipping beneath the radar of the crows. But, um, yeah, the, once the flock found them, they would go after them mercilessly, picking and jabbing at them as they go. It was a different story, however, when it was a bald eagle, because the bald eagle is big and strong and doesn't really, you know, to them, to the bald eagle, this flock of crows is like, ah, it's an annoyance at best. And uh, they could chase the bald eagle away with enough of them, but if, the, if for one reason the flock was divided, if they didn't have enough, it was only about like 10 of them going after the bald eagle. The bald eagle didn't particularly care and would keep circling to try to get the babies for a quick meal. But the crows, like I said, I would throw food out at the crows. Sometimes you'd play games with them. <laughs> I've got some photos of, uh, I, if I wanted crows in a, uh, a video, I would just go out and throw food down somewhere and then they would all show up. And as you're seeing right now, they would all show up and they would start to just go nuts picking. I would purposely sometimes save uh, if I had too much oatmeal or too, you know, there were, if there were bits and pieces of things I had, and I'd saved enough of it, I would dispense it for them to eat. And then they would go nuts picking and fighting over it. And of course, they always fought over their food, which I thought was really interesting. Um, one time, I remember a friend of mine, uh, uh, we were uh, eating wasabi on salmon. We had fresh salmon, and so I made uh, sushi, but we made some wasabi paste. And uh, actually, we had a wasabi ball eating contest, and we started off with a little bit like this, and then eventually went to... I think I got as far as about this big at once. My friend got to a ball this big. And then we got these rather sadistic idea of seeing if the crows <laughs> eat wasabi. And uh, 
Now, crows don't seem to notice um, uh, chilies, and they don't seem to have any particular reaction to chili pepper. But we were wondering, you know, because wasabi hits you differently, and uh, even this fake wasabi we get hits you differently, it makes your nose go, Ugh! would this affect the crows differently? So what we did was we created a little ball of like dough around the wasabi and then threw them out there. And what they would do, so that they wouldn't attack any, they wouldn't go for any food that was green. Green was like not on their menu. But if it was kind of beige-ish, look like breadcrumbs or, or rice or anything like that, corn, uh, they would be on that. And so we threw out these little disguised balls with was a ball of wasabi in the middle, just to experiment. My friend Nathan, we threw it out there. And the funny thing was that we watched and the crow would come down like, yes, come down. And a couple of them would start eating. And then all of a sudden they would, what, what they taste with the tip of their tongue in their beak, taste it and suddenly and then they would fly away. A pretty funny scenario, all in all. Um, but crows are interesting. When you throw enough food out, for instance, I often had fish scraps from cleaning fish, and I knew the best way to get, it, get rid of it was not to put it in the garbage where it would immediately start to stink, but rather to throw it onto the top of this woodshed. And then they would just take it all away from me. And if you sent them too much stuff, let's say you sent them a salmon head, which was like, for them, that was like that paradise to get a salmon head from me. They would take it, and then what they would do is hide it. So, and you'd see this, if I, if I mowed my lawn, they would come along and dig up uh, bits of grass and put it on top of something they were hiding. Uh, that they wanted to eat, save for later, which I thought was very interesting because rather than, I mean, a dog can't hide anything. As intelligent as dogs are, it's just like, it's all about now. It's just like, oh, there's food. Oh, there's more food. I got to keep eating. I got to keep eating. Whereas the crow is intelligent enough to say, oh man, I can't eat all this now. Let me put some over here and I'll come back for it. And of course, sometimes uh, there'll be other crows watching. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're always watching each other. What a strange society. Anyway, uh, ravens, I won't say too much about them because I had less interaction with them. Although, the way that ravens sound, I don't know if I can do this. Actually, let me look for a raven sound and put it right here. I was going to try to imitate one, but let me let you hear a real raven sound right there. Ravens, being larger, are more intelligent and, in Clinket mythology, literally are the creators of the world. And that is because, and they're also seen as the trickster. So uh, there are many Clinket legends about uh, or the raven, like walking along the beach and doing something, creating something. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, have all these stories in my head right now, but I've heard them. And it's a fascinating thing. Now, I think if you go behind the raven, like like who made the raven stuff, there are other things going on, the, a, a great spirit of sort. But nevertheless, the raven is that intelligent. Uh, uh, I was told by someone the raven can make uh, 27 sounds or something like that with their, their vocal cords. You know, I'm going, my friend Tom uh, said, how do we know it was 27? How, well, maybe there was 28 or 29. Because the, ra the ravens could do things like in Juneau. We, you never hear a car alarm in Haines, Alaska. But in Juneau, you would hear car alarms. And uh, it's a you know, slightly bigger city. Um, and there was some crime and people didn't want their cars broken into. But the ravens can actually imitate the sound of a car alarm. And that tells you something about the ravens. But anyway, ravens and crows, corvids, they're both in the corvid family. Uh, incredible creatures to watch. And I learned so much by doing so. And I'm just only hitting the tip of the iceberg with these. With all of these, what I'm going to say, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to say, oh, I should have said that. What about this story? What about that? I'm just winging it right now. So such is life.
Which brings us to the next slippery customer. The salmon. I live in Europe right now, in Tbilisi, Georgia. I've also been through Czech Republic, uh, Germany, England, uh, France, Switzerland, and they all have salmon for sale. And I feel so sorry for them. I can barely, every once in a while, I have something here that has a little salmon on it, and I just say, ah, it's just not the same. Because we had five species of salmon in the Chilkat River alone. Let's see if I can remember the names. There's the, uh, well, we have a, a technique for remembering the names. Thumb rhymes with chum, so there's a chum salmon that's also called the dog salmon because we feed it to our dogs, or maybe it looks like a dog. Uh, there's also the sockeye, or, and called sockeye because it had, you, you could poke someone's eye out and get a, and get a red eye. That's the other name is the red. The sockeye or the red salmon, they are commercially the most important because they have that red color that you really want your salmon to have. Uh, chum salmon isn't that bad, but you got to get it pretty fresh. Uh, don't overcook it. And you rarely, rarely see it for sale. Uh, it is made into dog food. <laughs> so, um, then there is, oh, one for the king. So you go thumb for the chum, sockeye, and then one for the king. <laughs> king salmon or the Chinook salmon. Some people say Chinook, but it's not a French word. It's Chinook. And uh, that's the big, big one. The largest one, I think uh, 97 pounds by uh I think it was 97 pounds by a rod and reel, uh, a salmon. Now, this is how big some of them get around inside. They don't get that long. Maybe I can't even do it here, can I? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they don't get that long, perhaps. But 97 pounds, about you know, 50 kilometer, kilometers. <laughs> oh, me and the metric system. 50 uh, kilograms um, heavy weighs. Uh, although I'm told that uh, in a net, I think 125 pounds was the largest, which would make it more like, uh, I don't know, 60 uh, kilograms or something like that. Um, a big fish, not so many of them. So there was this uh, King Salmon Derby at the beginning of the summer season where People would wait at the beginning of the Chilkat Inlet, where the the uh, the waters of the the ocean, the fjord, meets the Chilkat River, and they would try to get it. And often people would come up. You wouldn't get you know those big numbers I gave you. That's just for a very specific. Uh, th those are rare. More likely, you're going to get forty pounds, fifty pounds, or twenty twenty <laughs> kilograms, or you know thirty kilograms, somewhere in there. Uh, sometimes some will get one closer to 70 pounds or uh, 35 kilograms. And there have been years when we were told not to fish for them because the numbers were dwindling. And exactly why? No one had done the research. By the way, uh, well, I'll come to this in a minute. I'll try to remember, I'm crossing my fingers, to remember where the fish go when they leave. They are also anadromous fish. But let's finish the so. The ring finger, silver goes on the ring. So the silver salmon, which is also known as the coho salmon. Uh, and then you have the pinky, the pink salmon. We call in English, in American English, we call this the pinky finger sometimes. But it's the pink salmon or the humpy because the males get a big hump on their back when they go to spawn at the end of the year. So now each of these fish go out for a longer or shorter period of time into the ocean. They're born in this river, uh, the Chilkat River, or a tributary of the river, and they look for different kinds of conditions. So the red salmon will be looking for fast running water with gravel on the bottom, but not too deep, whereas the kings want much deeper water, and the humpies want you know, practically really shallow but 
uh, big gravel so that the eggs can fall inside the gravel and be protected from the predators. One uh, fish can have up to, I don't know, about uh, 2,000 uh, spawn from that. And the thing about uh, <laughs> the thing, the thing about salmon, it's a strange life. Uh, you know, you ha you're born with two thousand siblings or so. We'll, we'll just say, I mean, I'm sure some of them is only a thousand, but roughly two thousand. And from the time you're born till the time you die, everybody is out to eat you. So how many salmon get back? Uh, one or two out of those 2,000 make it back, they estimate, to the spot where they were born. Now, what's fascinating about that is the red salmon, for instance, the sockeye, it's also called red salmon because they turn bright red when they spawn. The red salmon or sockeye will go as far as Japan and come back across the Pacific Ocean to spawn in the same stream where it was born. I had a friend of mine who was a neuroscientist come and uh, some people had were cleaning some uh, salmon on the side of a lake and he said, can, can I see something here? And he went in and he opened up the brain. He pointed out this little peanut uh, pea sized brain and he said, this is what's motivating them to travel thousands and thousands of miles and kilometers across the ocean and come back to this spot, which is just amazing. How do they do it? Some people say it has something to do with magnetism and that something in their bodies can feel the magnetic, uh, you know, where they are, they can geolocate themselves. That's what they can do. Oh, but unfortunately here in Europe, everything is farm salmon. And farm salmon is far less nutritious than wild salmon. And this is a case where the farm salmon, uh, the farm salmon, can, they, they can be in these pens in the ocean that are, are way too close. They can get parasites. They might be fed uh, uh, antibiotics. Uh, they're probably fed a, uh, a dye to make them uh, look red because the red color comes from what they eat in the ocean as they're traveling. And it's not something that just simply happens genetically unless they eat the right food. And evidently one of the dyes that's been used on farm salmon is the same thing that was uh, banned for human consumption when used for tanning. Uh, and the omega-3 count is much lower. So, I must say, I was... Uh, Completely happy. That's one of the th people say, well, what do you miss from Alaska? Well, one of the things besides my friends and nature in general that I miss is the salmon. I can't do it. I can't, I can't eat the salmon that people here eat. They'll say, oh, I love the salmon. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you have no idea. You know, you just have no idea. It's just like, okay, I'm reminded of the story of the guy who was eating canned uh, drinking canned uh, orange juice that they, you know, concentrated orange juice and he was saying, oh, I love this stuff and the guy had to take him down to the uh, where they had a sale on oranges and make him fresh orange juice to understand the difference and that's the difference between wild salmon and canned salmon and specifically wild salmon that you go down to the dock, you take it home and you cook it that day there isn't any wild, unfrozen salmon. It's just, it's like fish butter. It's just so soft and has no chewy thing. You just cook it till it's warm and everybody's happy, including me. And uh, yeah, and I've eaten all the different varieties of salmon, uh, particularly the, uh, even the pink. Now, what's funny about the pink is the pink, the humpies, we just throw them back <laughs> or you feed them to your animals and the funny thing is in America you get all these cans of canned salmon and they're always pink salmon and, I just, <laughs> and people say yeah I don't like salmon and they're thinking of this canned salmon and I'm just like ah you just don't know you don't know you don't know um, 
Then there's, uh, let's see, what else can we talk about with the salmon? Well, of course, like I mentioned, the Clinkets were rich because they had literally so much salmon at their doorstep. And, and where the, uh, where the, uh, the main Clinket village was, Klekwan, was on a river, on the Chilkat River, right before it divides up into three different rivers. And the, the different species of salmon would go up different rivers. And so they had all the fish, literally they could walk outside their, their huts, their houses, their longhouses, go down to the river right near them, put their dip nets in, catch fish, put their, uh, their nets, of, of kind of fence-like nets in, catch fish, and have endless quantities of fish. Just fantastic. Eagles, bald eagles. Now, there are different phases of bald eagles. Some people think we have different kinds of eagles there, but they're all one eagle. They don't develop, the bald eagles have that white head. Why bald? Are they, they have no hair? No, it's called bald because that was an old world word for white and pale. So they had bald heads and in different phases, sometimes they would be mottled brown. They would be, uh, sometimes have white in the middle and brown on the head. And it was only in there, I think, the fourth or fifth year that they would get their white head. And by the fifth year, they would look like the bald eagle. So it took them five years to mature. And they weren't having any children. They almost, they were on the endangered list for quite a while. And one of the main reasons was all their eggs were breaking. And I think the research today says that that was largely caused by DDT. So, you have the bald eagle, so that's like if the crow is this and the raven is this, the bald eagle is, you see what I'm doing? You can't even put it in my screen. The bald eagle is much bigger with, uh, what was it, about a six, seven foot wingspan, so it's like two meter wingspan. Quite a large bird. Not a particularly aggressive bird, though, although <laughs> uh, that my cat who lived mostly outdoors, um, would occasionally come in and I had an overhead fan that someone had put in my house that I had been renting for years. And if I click that on, my cat would panic and run out of the house. And what's funny is that, you know, in the world, in most places, the cats go after the birds. The cats sit and wait and pounce. But in Alaska, the birds go after the cats. <laughs> and we often joked, uh, you know, what was the biggest thing you've ever seen an eagle uh, carrying? And, and, you know, some people got to Toyota Prius. <laughs> you know, thank you, Tom Lang. But literally, some little cats had been taken away. And I think my cat had been exposed to a bald eagle attack at some point. And so became really nervous around bald eagles. Wasn't really happy about crows and ravens either. So, one of the most important things about bald eagles in our area is that because of these salmon runs, now how long did the salmon runs go on? The salmon runs would start in late May with the kings. And then the next run would be the sockeye or red salmon, and then eventually you get the, uh, the chum, and then you get the coho salmon, and finally you get the pinks. Uh, and the pinks would be coming through the summer. But there were more than one chum run, and one chum run or, uh, would actually last, I mean, you'd see them coming in until January or February even, dribbling in. So that's quite, quite a long time, much longer than most places, which meant the second, uh, there was a silver run in September, 
And then the late dog salmon run, the second one, would come in. And that meant that while there was snow on the ground, there were fish in the river. And one of the interesting things is that the river, which is largely fed by glaciers, and the glacial water contains a lot of silt, once the glaciers stopped melting in, say, late September, early October, then the water would clarify, it would, it would lower and clarify, and then the eagles could easily see where the salmon were. And so there was a, besides late chum run, there was a gathering of bald eagles. We had eagles from as far away as I think Idaho and Oregon that had been traced uh, there, as well as from the Yukon, the interior of Alaska, British Columbia, all descending, thousands of eagles. I think the highest number one year was around 4,000, but at least two or 3,000 every year. Eagles descending, the largest bald eagle gathering in the world, descending upon uh, this, this, uh, the Chilkat River for the Eagle Feast. And the eagles would also bring photographers because everyone knew there were eagles in the trees everywhere. It was not uncommon to see 10 eagles in one tree. It was not uncommon to see eagles across the whole uh, panorama of the horizon. Wherever you saw trees, you'd sit there and count. I remember counting one, starting at a certain point way across the river and counting and going across every little dot in the trees, getting to about 300 and stopping, oh, just going you know, just a slight distance across the horizon. So, yeah, and you could just drive there. I remember taking my mother out there several times. She loved to see them. And she was always just amazed that they would just sit and look down at her. Because the eagles, being an apex predator, know, ah, you're a human being. You, you're, there's very little you can do to me if you're not hunting me. And since it's illegal for you to hunt me, eh, we don't care anymore. But also the eagles would get so much food that they could just hang out and kind of dry their wings in the, uh, the trees. So people would actually come from all over the world, uh, not in huge numbers, maybe 100, uh, I think uh, 125, 150 people a year would come in November for what we called the Bald Eagle Festival to see these. And if you're interested in eagles and ever want to see a lot in one place, go to Haines, Alaska, look up Bald Eagle Festival, Haines, Alaska on the internet, and you can make your reservation. And it does cost a bit, and uh, but it's well worth doing. And Haines, even at that time of year, yeah, there's snow, but oh, it's so beautiful. Okay, we're increasing in size. Now we're talking about a mammal that's a bit bigger than what I can hold my hands across at. Uh, the size of a large, large dog. And that animal is an animal I only saw once. And it was an animal that wasn't supposed to exist in our area. And that's the mountain lion, also known as the puma or the cougar. And I think there are a couple of other crazy names, but we'll call them the mountain lion. I like mountain lion. So the mountain lion is a medium-sized cat, not nearly as large as tigers and lions. Uh, a little bit smaller maybe than a cheetah or around the same size. But I knew that they were down the coast in British Columbia, and I'd heard of, of, ball, of mountain lions there. But no one had ever seen one in the valley. And I was driving a busload of tourists up to a, uh, a rafting trip about 2016 and 2017. And I was driving these people uh, up there. And while I'm giving my spiel through a microphone, I stop for a minute and just start stop talking and I'm looking at the road and I say, I can't even begin to describe that because I didn't want them to see what I saw. I didn't, they couldn't see what I saw because I passed it by the time uh, I could even register it. It was such a shock. It was a mountain lion coming from the river out and going up into the mountains. And we have uh, the Chilkat River is right next to very tall mountains that go up several thousand feet. I saw it slinking around the road and then going into the trees. I was just like, wait a minute, that was a mountain lion. Uh, and I went back and I couldn't even tell anybody for a while because I was just sitting there going, could I have seen a mountain lion? I go, yeah, I did. I saw a mountain lion. 
And I went and uh, I was down at the docks waiting for more people. This was in the summer, waiting for more people to take. And someone said, yeah, someone the year before had seen one further up. And evidently, someone else had seen one over by Chilkoot Lake, which was in a different valley uh, with the Chilkoot River. And evidently, they were being seen more and more further north from us in Whitehorse. And what seems to have happened is the, the mountain lion had gone up through the back door, so to speak, in through the, not the coast, the coast of Alaska and Canada. If you look at it, it's shaped like this. It's really hard to travel around there, which is why, for instance, our area has moose, but 13 miles away by water, there are no moose in uh, Skagway because there's a mountain like this between the two. And you could go on and the edge of the water just goes straight in. There's no way for a large animal like a moose to get there. So what was fascinating is they seem to have gone around through the drier part of British Columbia up to Whitehorse and were now dropping down from Whitehorse through the, uh, the mountain passes and such, which I thought was interesting. And since then, I think there have been several more sightings. So, mountain lion. Now, the weird thing about the mountain lion, we have very dangerous animals in the Chilkat Valley and Chilkoot Valley. We have very large brown bear. We have black bears. We have, well, moose are quite dangerous. And we have wolves, plus coyotes and foxes and things like that. But none of them. We also have the wolverine, which may be the most dangerous animal when backed into a corner, but none of them were as directly predatory as a mountain lion. A mountain lion would wait hidden on a trail for you to come and pounce on you. And I'm talking about you as a human being. And there was a story, uh, I think it was down in Oregon earlier that year where Two bicyclists were jumped by a mountain lion uh, that was hidden off to the side, and one of them was killed. So that's the kind of creature that was there. Fortunately, not many of them. And fortunately, the, the land is patrolled by much larger creatures. So, just a little grace note there. I saw a mountain lion in the wild in Alaska in a valley it wasn't supposed to be in. I consider that pretty cool. Um, wolves. Likewise, there were at least two, perhaps three packs of wolves in the area that we knew of. I never saw them. I did see wolves at my friend uh, Steve Kershaw's, uh Wildlife Center, where he would take uh, abandoned or orphaned animals or animals in, that had been in accidents or something and rehabilitate them. And then he would also take people through there to see them. And so I saw wolves there, and in fact, let me play you a bit of a recording of one of his wolves, along with the sound of a raven here. So yes, I have the sound of a wolf and a raven uh, together, which is a, an amazing recording. That This would happen almost as soon as he left looking at them and took the people further into his wildlife sanctuary. And then the wolves would start, the wolf, it was just one, would start to howl. Fascinating. But I never saw one in the wild. However, once in the middle of uh, a day of work, uh, waiting for people, I would be the person to catch people in the rafts at the end, sometimes literally catching, preventing them from going down the river. But uh, I'd be waiting for them to come so we could take them off and uh, take them back to the ships. And I was waiting there alone with another friend who had driven the gear truck that we hauled the rafts on. And all of a sudden, I heard, oh, several of them not very far away in the middle of the day. Now, we, I was right next to a mountain, so you couldn't locate where the sound was coming from because it echoed so much, but it wasn't that far away. And to hear them in the middle of the day like that, oh, another time 
I was on top of a frozen lake, a Chilkoot Lake, in the middle of the winter, and they were howling in the distance at night. And my final wolf anecdote, and all I can tell you, I can't even begin to explain that experience. It was way too spooky and beautiful. But here's the one that really chilled me. I had a French friend, uh, Paulette, come to visit me. And um, it was in March one year. And she was there to help uh, do a puppet show. But I said, okay, well, you have to see more of this world and one of the places I knew was open and free of snow was the bedrock or not the bedrock but the silt flats of the Chilkat River. Bedrock would actually be 700 feet below that in the silt which is another story. But but so we went out there now the silt was frozen and we went out and it was a full moon out wonderful to go out in full moons in the winter and as we're walking, we, I, I wanted to take her to where the river was. So we walked quite a ways into the middle of the valley, a place that would be covered with water in the middle of the summer. And you could just look around you, and the mountains were glowing with uh, the alpen glow from the moon. And it was just an incredible moment. And then I looked down, and I saw a footprint frozen, it looked fairly fresh, though, in the, uh, the silt, bigger than my hand. And I have very big hands. And it wasn't a bear. It was a wolf. And then I, I, so I turned to her, and then I looked, and I saw another one. It looked like it had been made the day before and then frozen at night. I saw another one near it, and then another one near it. And I said, oh, wolves come out here. And wolves do like to hunt at night. Maybe we should make our way back. So I, I pointed out the tracks. And then I said, why don't, why don't we just kind of move back? And the next day I talked to a friend of mine, Scott. And uh, I said, Scott, Scott lived up in the mountains. Uh, uh, not too far up, because you couldn't live very far up on the mountain. But far enough that he could look over the Chilkat silt flats. And I said, Scott, do you ever see wolves out there? And he goes, oh yeah, all the time. You can see the packs running across. I said, okay, uh, well, I dodged the bullet on that one. So that's my wolf story, uh, a non-wolf story. Which brings us to the most, when people think Alaska, this is the creature that immediately comes to mind, and it is the bear. And we're going to talk about two types of bears. There is the brown bear. <laughs> The black bear. Now, the black bear is very specific to America. It is North America, I should say. It is uh, the American black bear is is big, but it isn't massive. And these are the bears most people see when they drive through places like Yosemite in California or Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, or on the East Coast in the, uh, the Appalachian Mountains. It, the black bear is mostly what you're going to meet. Now, they are annoying, and they are bigger than the largest dog uh, by some degree. They're also fatter and have a lot of hair. Uh, they're more curious than the brown bear. They can be more aggressive, particularly in looking for food. Part of it is that people have left out food, particularly in the, uh, the lower 48, as we call the contiguous United States. Uh, people leave too much garbage around with food in it. And the bears know people relate to food, and so they will come up. Now, what you're supposed to do if you, well, first of all, we also have the brown bear. And the brown bear in Alaska is a much larger animal. The brown bear, 
Well, let's describe the brown bear for a moment. People will often call the brown bear a grizzly bear. And technically speaking, they're right. There is no real difference biologically between a brown bear and a grizzly bear, except the following. Uh, now, there are brown bears in Europe and Asia, all across the Russian taiga. Uh, there are brown bears here in Georgia. Uh, I think it's the Syrian brown bear or some relative thereof. Uh, they aren't that big. They're big. They're bigger than a black bear, but they're not the size they are in Alaska. There's also another very large species in the Kamchatka Peninsula. And what makes these bears along the northern coast so large is the supply of salmon. Salmon essentially is the superfood of animals in Alaska and human beings, I might say. It is incredibly nutritious. But the the, the brown bear uh, in Alaska, now there's the Kodiak variant of the brown bear, which is massive, but evidently the second largest bear ever found was up the Chilkoot Valley. Brown bear ever found was up the Chilkoot Valley. Uh, and I once saw a bear as we were driving a bus full of people from a raft trip back. We saw a bear on the side of the road that was about the size that I am, standing up, sitting down. Incredible, with a head like this. Just an incredible bear. A, ro a male bear. And uh, these are just incredible creatures. Now, evidently, the brown bear, the male of the species, never stops growing. So, it's, it's one incredible thing. So, hold that thought. I'm going to tell you about taking people to see those bears. But let's go back to... Uh, oh, well, let me tell you the difference between the, uh, the grizzly bear and the brown bear. It's location. If a bear has access to all that coastal salmon, they are a brown bear. Uh, in Alaska, we call them the coastal brown bear. If they don't, if they live further inland and don't have much uh, connection to the uh, salmon, then they're a grizzly bear. And the difference is the grizzly bear has to dig a lot more for roots and things. They get a, a bigger hump on their back. They're much uh, more aggressive when it comes to food, which is why there have been more deaths with grizzly bears in places like Glacier National Park in Montana and Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming than there have been on the coast in Alaska with brown bears. Because where I live, the bears have all the food they could possibly want. It's just, we're just lousy with, you know, salmon. So the bears are happy as they can possibly be, and in almost narcotic state because of that. And that makes them quite, I wouldn't say tame, but approachable within reason. But let's hold that thought. How do you tell the difference between a brown bear and a black bear? You might be saying, well, burn, it's because you know, one's brown, one's black. Well, no, that's not it. The, the brown bear can range from dark brown to a kind of reddish cinnamon color. And the black bear can be black, brown, there's a gray, kind of silvery colored one uh, that uh, we call the glacier bear. There's a white one that we call the spirit bear, very rare, but I have seen one while I was there. I was on a uh, uh, jet boat tour uh, up in the upper uh, Chilkat River, and we saw one climbing the sides of the mountain. Incredible. Uh, but, and it wasn't a polar bear, it was an all-white black bear, American black bear. What's interesting, though, is a large brownish phase black bear might look a lot like a smaller female brown bear. And how do you tell the difference? Well, here's how you tell the difference. It, it, you know, how do you know if it's a black bear or a brown bear? Also... Maybe it is really easy to tell, but you're not. You can't. You, you're in a panic, and you don't know what to do. So you climb a tree. If it climbs up after you, it's a black bear. 
if it knocks the tree over, it's a brown bear. <laughs> There's also another way. Uh, if you uh, are walking along a trail, and what do you carry? Some people say you should carry a bear spray. I have a friend who just says, not just carry a gun. Although I read a book that said the best thing you can do with a handgun if a bear comes is put it in your mouth and pull the trigger. Because it doesn't do anything to the bear very much. You know, you need a much larger weapon than that. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I prefer the air horn, but actually I, I would almost never use anything. I remember one time I was taking what I called a... Uh, I often saw bears crossing the road. Uh, often. Black bears, brown bears, often saw them crossing the road. And you could tell you when you were getting near bears because of the what we call bear scat on the side of the road or in the middle of the road. Uh, uh, you know, there's the old uh, expression, does a bear shit in the woods? And goes, no, it waits to gets to the road and then does it in the middle of the road. And here's the other way you can tell the difference between a black bear and a brown bear. If it's got berries and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, vegetation in it, it's a blackberry. And if it's got berries and maybe a bit of squirrel and some plaid uh, clothing in it, it's probably a brown bear. <laughs> That's just a joke, obviously. But, um, but yeah, I used to go mushroom hunting in the middle of uh, September by myself without anything, uh, no protection. Uh, and all I can say, one of the things about living in bear country is that what it does is it makes you really aware. There's what I call bear aware. Um, to know that there are bears in the environment makes you much more attentive to the world around you. Because you say to yourself, I have to listen really carefully. You're smelling things really carefully. Um, if you smell, for instance, in the winter, if you smell a really heavy smell of rotting meat, that could be a couple of different things related to bears. One could be a bear trap or a, a trap for uh, some other animal for uh, fur hunting. And you don't want to get near it in case you step in it. But it also could be a cache of meat for uh, and animals left there. But in in September, I'm looking for mushrooms. I'm looking for chanterelles. I'm looking for bolites. I'm looking for these things. So you, you go to certain places where you know you've seen mushrooms before. In the woods. Alone. Quiet. I once went for a walk. Uh, I love the movies of Andrei Tarkovsky and his camera slowly pans over an environment and you, you really start to look at it. So I was kind of taking what I call a Tarkovsky walk and I was slowly going through and I wasn't, I wasn't making noise. Normally when you walk through the forest in bear country, every now and then, especially when you can't see, if you're coming around a blind turn, you can't see anything, you'd go like, hello bear, or you make some sounds, we're here, or you just talk if you've got friends, because the bears will hear you and go, ah, yeah, we don't want to deal with these people. You aren't on the bear's menu. And if they know you're coming, they're going to say no. Unless, of course, you're doing something stupid, like wearing perfume or cooking bacon or, uh, you know, other things that would attract the bear through scent. Because the bears do smell really well. I, by smell really well, I mean miles and, kilo and kilometers away they can smell their nose is so good i don't know if there's an animal that smells better than them if anyone knows of an animal that smells better than a brown bear let me know uh but yeah so you don't want to be stupid your human smell should be enough to keep you away uh ladies i wouldn't suggest going out there at certain times of the month but uh it's, you know, the, uh, so I would go out there and I would be um, very quiet. Oh, yeah, the Tarkovsky walk. So I'm on my Tarkovsky walk, walking very carefully on this trail, just silently looking at everything. The little 
the the berries, you know, the the ripening uh, rose hips and the water. I'm walking on this wooden, long kind of primitive wooden plank, and there's water flowing under me and and things growing in the water. And um, I'm going to a place where there's a waterfall, Seven Mile, for those of you who know. And all of a sudden, I get to a certain point, and a black bear jumps up and runs off. <laughs> I said to myself, okay, I think the walk's over. <laughs> but getting back to mushroom hunting, like I said, there's the tension between the silence of just being in the forest and the reality that there are creatures there larger than yourself who could appear at any moment. Now, one thing I did know is that time of year, most of the bears are going to be near the river hunting, uh, going to get some salmon. And so that was one thing in my favor, although not all of them would be. You know, some of them are out looking for berries. So what I would be listening for, and it is listening mostly, is this sound. <coughs> something walking through the area. Unfortunately, I never ran into that, but I was always aware. But we'll keep that in mind for another story. Uh, there are so many things that I've seen related to bears. I mean, bears seem to... One of the things, you know, there was that old uh, television show, Northern Exposure. And when you mention Alaska, a lot of people who watched that show back in the day would always say, oh yeah, Northern Exposure. And I watched Northern Exposure before I got to Haynes. And in fact, in fact, Haynes was one of the places that Northern Exposure was partly based on. And I thought, as soon as I got there, I realized, oh, this is why you know Northern Exposure was filmed in the state of Washington on an island in the Puget Sound and not in Alaska. No one talks about bears. I think there's one or two episodes where bears feature into the discussion. Whereas, in reality, you think about bears every day in Alaska. Because they're everywhere. And there are two, th two seasons. There's the bear season and the snow and ice season. And the bear season is when you have to be really careful of what, where you are. And the snow and ice season is when you realize... The snow and ice can kill you. So there are two dangers, two central things. You always think about these things. And if you don't, if you get mixed up and you just act stupidly, the environment will not reward you. Let me tell you a couple of bear stories. I've got four listed here, but this is taking quite a while already. And I don't want to uh, spend too long. We'll tell this, this scary story first. A friend of mine, Richard Buck, uh, married to Brigitte. She's from Germany. They lived over uh, near uh, Chilkoot Lake in what's called the Lutak Inlet area. And directly behind his house, the mountain just goes straight up. He was a hunter, and he would go up. And on one specific day... Is looking to hunt some mountain goats. Mountain goats are shaggy white creatures, more related to antelopes than goats. And so he decided to go hunting for a goat. A uh, goat makes uh, good eating, uh, a bit like deer meat. As he was going straight up, he found himself in kind of an open clearing. And he looked in one direction and he saw a couple of bear cubs. By the way, the Lutak Chilkoot Corridor Inlet area is where most of the bears are in this one valley. And we're talking lots of bears. And as soon as he looked over there, he suddenly realized he didn't know where the mother was. And he looked the other way, and the mother was already running towards him. Now, he was hunting, so he had a rifle with him. It wasn't probably the kind of rifle you needed, but fortunately he was a good shot, and he shot and killed the mother bear when it was literally only a couple yards, a couple meters away. And he told me that story, I was just thinking, like, I would have been dead. 
<laughs> you know, because I wouldn't have had a gun for one thing. But, but yeah, the worst thing, the thing about bears is you don't want to get in their way. And I mentioned that I used to take people on tours to see bears. We were going to go along the Chilkoot River corridor and I could get close enough to a bear. Some of the images you're looking at right now are from the Chilkoot River. And I could get close enough that the, the picture I'm showing you is not with a telephoto lens. It is, there. I'm not in a car. I'm just standing there. I might be with a group of people. Some of these I'm not with a group of people. Or maybe there's some other people a little bit further on who are looking for bears to uh, photograph. But we could do this because the bears were so preoccupied with salmon that they didn't care about us. Like I was saying, there's, there's a kind of a narcosis that takes place with bears and salmon. Uh, the, the salmon are much more interesting, you know, especially a nice rotting salmon is, oh, the bears are going to go for that. But they like the live ones putting up a fight just as well. But uh, the bear, the, these are all brown bears. Occasionally, one will see a black bear looking for uh, salmon, but they're not in the same place where you see the brown bears. Brown bears will chase them away. So, what happened was that uh, I would have to give people warnings. Because, like I said, these are not tame bears. You may think they are, but if you do something wrong, and something wrong is particularly what happened to my friend Richard. If you stand between a mother and her cubs, and I can see very stupid people. I used to give a safety talk before we would get out of our van. And I would tell people, now you may see people doing stupid things here, but we're not going to be one of them. I say, here's rule number one. Listen to me. You don't know anything about bears. I do. I get trained to deal with this. Uh, you don't. So, if I tell you to do something, if I tell you to stop doing something, you stop. You just listen to me. Because otherwise, it's not going to work. Uh, I would also tell them, you see how tall I am now? I once saw a bear that tall. Sitting down. <laughs> um, you know, and I would do... I would, what, you know what it is, is that people on in cruise ships and tours and such, they're not in their right mind. They don't know where they are. They, they're, and I'm going to deal with this whole glitch in reality problem when I eventually get to my uh, series about travel, and I'll get more into these tourist-related issues then. But people simply, they don't understand what they're looking at. They've been on a, a huge floating hotel, that has all the conveniences you could possibly imagine. They don't even know they've left the world to enter someplace as strange as Alaska. They don't understand where they are. Meanwhile, their experience is, is mediated by people like me who take them out and have to kind of watch them, a bit like you watch children. And so you're in this zone of being a tourist. And I also think of this in terms of people who talk about the value of psychedelics. Well, the value of psychedelics if there is one, and there might be, but I'm not going to try one, try them to find out. Because there is the reality inside your head, and people who say, we're constructing it all with our minds. And I would, I would have to say, your mind is really fantastic because one of the constructions that supposedly you made is the bear that we're going to see. And that bear will kill you if you think you're in your own reality. There's the movie Grizzly Man. It's a documentary assembled by Werner Herzog, uh, which I recommend, but if you ever watch this movie, Alaskans kind of look at this as a dark comedy about a Californian guy who comes to live in Alaska, calls the bears his friends, dude, and uh, eventually gets himself and his girlfriend killed because he wants to keep getting closer to them. And there's enough footage of him with bears, like basically video selfies with him and a bear right behind him that, you know, he had to run a good luck, but he didn't realize one of the things bears hate is being surprised, which is why my friend Richard got in trouble. He surprised the bear. By the way, the only really good 
uh, bear attack scene I've ever seen in a movie that really strikes me as a bear attack scene is in the movie Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. <clears throat> and I saw that movie in the theaters. And halfway in the middle of it, he's knocked down. The bear is walking away and he starts getting up. And I'm just going, no, don't move. Play dead. That's how you escape. But no, he gets up. And then the second half of the bear attack, <laughs> it's just like, I guess he didn't take our bear courses. <laughs> but, uh, but the point is, the bear is a good antidote for people who think that reality is somehow locked inside your head. You cannot live that way around bears. Your reality is not locked inside your head. You know, put a bear in your environment, you will change everything you believe if that's what you believe. A bear is not a friend to your psychedelic experiences. It is not your creation. It's a bear. And all I can say is you have to be in the presence of a bear to get it. And I don't mean at the zoo. I mean, you have to be in an environment where they can pop out at any time. Which is how we can take people, some of the, sad, sad to say, stupidest people on earth, to see bears and they not get killed. We can kind of manage the experience because we know the bears. We spent time with the bears. We have names for them. Like, like here's one called Speedy. And uh, one year she had uh, three cubs. Here's two of them. Uh, and Speedy was a friend. We haven't seen her. I think she passed away a few years ago. But, uh, you know, for many years, Speedy was our star. We called her Speedy because I think she had a broken paw at one point. But she got over it and got her speed back up. But, you know, we got to know the bears. My friends Tom and Pam and, and Joe and all these other people, they knew the bears. We know what they react. We knew that Speedy was cool, but there's maybe another guy with a ring around his uh, neck who wasn't cool. And we know, that, oh, okay, let's stay away from this bear. And, you know, so um, let me just end with one more story. This is a story we used to tell uh, people uh, just to kind of, this is on the, the bright side of bear encounter stories as opposed to the dark side. There's a lot on the dark side. Uh, a lot of it involving human stupidity. But, uh, and I heard this from, uh, again, my friend Tom Lang, who was a, uh, a tour guide for a long time, still is, I believe, in summers. Uh, Tom, if you're at all here, let us know. I'm probably not going to say anything right here. You might say it on Facebook or something. Yeah, evidently there was, up north of us in the Yukon Territory, is a place called the Kluwani National Park, which has the tallest mountain in Canada, 19,000 feet. What is that in meters? That's about uh, 6,000 meters or so. Uh, very tall mountain. And uh, there are hiking trails there. The place is lousy with bears. Lots of big brown bears who do get fed by the coastal salmon. So, uh, one day there was a guy doing kind of what I was doing, the Tarkovsky walk, around <laughs> on a mountain trail there with, uh, you know, he's just being real quiet, taking it all in. And all of a sudden he comes around. Now, I've already told you, you should be making some noise as you're going around, particularly blind turns on a trail in the woods or in the mountain. He's coming around a blind tour and there's a grizzly bear directly in front of him. Now, there's a whole scenario of what you should do in the presence of a bear. And it depends on seeing the bear from afar, if the bear comes close to you, you know, what you can do, what kind of bear is it? Is it a black bear? Is it a brown bear? There's all these different questions. But anyway, he was at the last stage. And the last stage is get down, do what Leonardo DiCaprio didn't do, play dead. And so he gets down and you roll into a ball you put your hands over your back, back of your neck, and if the bear bites into it, don't move, don't cry out, just pretend to be dead. I know this sounds horrendous, but that's what you got to do. And you roll up into a curve or something to protect your private parts. So, he gets down, curls up on the side, the bear comes up to him, sniffs him, lays down next to him, and falls asleep. What would you do? 
uh, later in the Yukon newspaper, he said it was the longest 45 minutes of his life. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet it was. <laughs> Can you imagine being in that scenario? And coming along the trail, much to his delight, was a forest ranger. And she looks at the trail, sees the man and the bear kind of spooning there. And she says, oh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? She kind of says, you know, are you okay? And he's like, you know, how okay can you be with a bear, you know, snuggling up behind you there? <laughs> so she's, she's a quick thinker, though. She's a good thinker. She starts getting large rocks and stones and throwing them off into the forest. And eventually the sound wakes the bear up and it goes down to see what it is. And then she takes the guy back. And uh, all I can say is if I was that guy, I would keep laminated copies of the article from the Yukon newspaper just to prove the story is true. <laughs> so, bears. Okay, just a couple more animals and we're done. Uh, yeah, we have three more to go for the largest animals. You thought the bear was the large one. No! The moose is larger than the bear. The moose, full-grown moose, can stand like two meters, six or seven feet at the shoulder. It's not counting where the head's going. It can have horns, uh, antlers that, I mean, literally are just massive. Um... And they are dumb as a box of rocks. These are the stupidest creatures I've ever... They're like cows. And I don't know about you, but I've never had an intellectual conversation with a cow. <laughs> I'm, and they are dangerous. Moose are responsible for killing more people in Alaska than bears are. They, they kill them in different ways. One, by stomping them, they get up on their hind legs and they come down with a scissor kick. And two, let me see if I can find that video of uh, the guy in Anchorage who gets scissor kicked by a moose in, in the University of Alaska. And two... They cause so many accidents on the road because they don't look which way they're going. And the worst time of year is in like October because, and I've, I have had this happen, you're driving down the side of the road, it's dark. There isn't snow on the sides of the mountain yet, so there's nothing to reflect light. And I remember just passing right close to the side of the road, a moose-shaped black hole right in the middle of town. And I was just thinking like, all I had to do is take two more steps out, bam, I would have hit it. Um, moose, winter. Yeah, they're active all winter. They eat uh, willow branches, which contain salicylic acid, which is uh, aspirin, basically. Um, fascinating. I can tell you endless moose stories. And I've taken a few images of moose. But... Let me just tell you a couple of stories. One, one was that I brought my friend Imogen Heap, who's a musician. She did one of her first concerts ever up in Alaska. In fact, her first full-length solo piano, piano concert was done in Haines, Alaska. And I brought her up before she was famous. Uh, and I took her out one evening uh, towards uh, Chilkat State Park. And on the dirt road going out there... There was a moose, and it was just sitting there eating. We just pulled the car up. It was actually my old Ford truck, it was just an old beat-up truck, uh, pickup truck. We just parked along the side of the road. Uh, not parked, but we idled next to it, and it just sat there and chewed away. And it was amazing. It was kind of like twilight time at night. Then we saw a couple more. I took her up into Canada, and uh, on the way back, we saw three more across the road, a moose and two younger ones, uh, probably the mother and two cows, cross the road. So, now, you can't, uh, you can't possibly plan that kind of thing, especially in the summer. Uh, May is the time when you can see the most moose. I have a great photo here of what's probably a pregnant uh, moose cow going off to deliver a calf. 
But you'll notice she's out in the middle of the river. They swim quite well. Out in the middle of the river on a sandbar, on a silt bar, gravel bar. Um, and will deliver the calf there in order to um, give birth and to protect the baby, the calf, from the predators. The predators don't want to swim out there. And in fact, one time I saw a calf. Now, this is an image here of a young calf uh, that I saw at uh, about 14 mile. Uh, it was probably born that day. The mother is nowhere in sight. But uh, here's a young calf. They have little spindly legs. They look like uh, a little log with toothpicks on them for legs. But I saw one that was like this one freshly delivered, so fresh that the mother was just there. We pulled up with our vans at uh, 21 mile. And we, uh, when I say this is 21 miles on the Haynes Highway, but we just call it 13 mile, 21 mile, whatever. Uh, and we showed up there and the mother ran across through the water into the woods, into the, uh, the woods across the water leaving the baby alone on the silt bar, on the gra it was really more of a gravel bar, uh, sitting there. And we were there for like an hour waiting for the rafts to come in on the river. And as we watched, we just sat there and watched it, and it sat there, it was stood there frozen, just like my photo shows, a little thing frozen standing there. And it didn't move, looked like it couldn't move. We were saying, well, I hope mom comes back soon because this little guy needs somebody. And suddenly, at a certain point, it moves one leg, then another. I should mention that the water in front of it, there's, there's quite a bit of water in front of this uh, place on the Chilkat River. And it's early June and the water is quite high and it's moving quite fast from the melting snow. Yeah. And as it moves and now it's going straight down to the water and I'm, we're all sitting there, eh, don't do that. Don't go to the water. Go, go the other way that, to mom. That looks safer. But no, it walks into the roaring River. I mean, this river is really pumping. If you were in a raft on this, which my friends were, it would be quite hard to stop. I mean, it was, it was moving. And all you could see was the little nose, the snout, staying up. Somehow, it's swimming. Now, this thing was probably less than an hour old when we arrived. And within an hour, it was swimming across the river, and then it climbs up with its spindly little legs and finds a little spot in the tall grass to sit and wait for Mom. We went over and looked at it, didn't get very close, and we were hoping Mom would come and take it away. We never saw that, but it wasn't there the next day. We assume Mom eventually did come, we hope, rather than one of the predators showed up. So... And that made me think, the thing is born, and within an hour and a half or so, it's swimming in a body that looks like it shouldn't swim anywhere. How does that happen? And I thought to myself, evidently there are things about DNA we don't know. Because this is much more complicated a pattern than anything you could possibly, you know. How, do, how does that get put into information in a body? Because it, the mother didn't have a chance to teach it anything. I'm absolutely sure of that. So, but that's that kind of thing. And, and often looking at animals does that to you. It makes you wonder, raises questions about the nature of the world we live in. I've also heard stories. I had a friend of mine who told me he couldn't get out of the house. I have actually more than one friend who told me they couldn't leave their, their cabin because there was a bull moose or another moose, mama moose or some kind of moose, at their door not letting them out of the house. And I can believe it. I've run across moose 
I remember once sitting on a huge rock on my birthday one year. I was in the forest. And I figured th this rock was two times as tall as I am. And I climbed up on a big, looked like a big round egg with moss on it. And I sat there. It was a great place to sit and read and think. And through the trees, I could see the movement of a shape. It was probably a moose. It could have been a bear. I don't know. But I'll tell you, seeing animals in the wild is so much more radically different than seeing them in any situation we place them in. So, <clears throat> moose. Pretty incredible animals. And dumb. And I'll just leave you with this. Dumb and dangerous. I'll leave you with uh, the moose on this one story. A good friend of mine uh, was driving down the road. She is uh, Clinket. And she was looking off into the Chilkat River, which kind of one of the uh, braids of the river winds along the side of the road. And she was looking at it, actually hoping to see a moose. On the other side of the road is a cliff like this. So there's like a river over here, the road, and a cliff like this. A moose, a moose steps out of this, walks straight in front of her, her car crashes. She is, uh, will be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life because of that. She is, uh, paralyzed. And that's why you don't take anything for granted with animals. You, you, you simply can't. You can't go up and try to get the best photo of a moose without a great deal of respect and some knowledge of what moose do. Because you can't tell if they are angry or not until they suddenly arise. They don't, like I said, it's much easier to understand bear behavior than moose behavior. So, moose, respect all these animals. You deserve a great deal of respect. Stellar sea lions. I've already mentioned the size of the sea lions and seals. I saw plenty of little gray harbor seals. Mm -hmm. I told you about the stellar sea lions that would come looking for the hooligan. The size of a bull stellar sea lion can be up to 11 feet, like uh, two and a half, three and a half meters long, and 2,500 pounds. 1,200 kilograms. This is a massive, massive creature. And we would go out to what we call the sea lion rocks. Now, I've been out there a couple of times, and they were in this one spot, and they always came there during May and June, sometimes July, there. And they were there for the food. And the Bull stellar sea lions would be there. Sometimes they would roll over and crush some of the smaller, probably babies, because the babies didn't know what they were doing. But this was their rookery. Absolutely horrifying. 
and the sound wasn't much better because this was not the kind of society you'd want to belong to. All the sea lions make this kind of sound. So all of them together is this... It's like, wah! This is not my society, folks. <laughs> it's a stinky dead fish smell mixed with, uh, whatever, seal excrement and this grumbling, complaining, whining sound. But fascinating to go up to. Hundreds and hundreds of uh, sea lions there. This is, oh, I think it's not, I think a rookery is very specific. I think that's a place for birth. So this would be a pullout or a haul out where they would just pull themselves out and kind of sun themselves on this one group of rocks. And um, one day, I remember we went out there in a, a friend's uh, kind of pleasure boat. Well, it was actually an officially a, a tour boat, but it was early in the season before the tourists had come. It was in May. And we went out there, and we were watching these big sea lions, the, the males, the females, the pups, all diving in and coming out of the water on one side. And then on the other side of the boat, right next to us, feeding on the same fish that the seals, sea lions were feeding on, was a humpback whale. And I'll never forget them. Like one side of me is a humpback whale breaching, coming up with its mouth and going down, and the other side, and I'm not talking very far apart here. Um, I mean, how do I explain it in a kind of neutral way that anybody could understand it? Uh, not as far apart as a regular back-and-forth two-lane road. <laughs> One side, the cliffs and the, the, the rocks and the sea lions and, and hundreds of sea lions. The other side... A humpback whale. This was one of the, my mind-blowing experiences. Um, speaking of seals, I saw something at the beginning of my trip there that I didn't think was probably very unusual, but turned out to be very unusual. And it was an eagle, a bald eagle, trying to pull a small seal out of the water. <laughs> and I saw them wrestling out there. And later I found out this never happens. See, uh, bald eagles usually aren't that stupid, but for some reason, it was happening, uh, even though people said it didn't. Now, this photo is probably the most mysterious photo that I have taken. It doesn't look like much. It looks like a seal laying around near some water. But what you have to understand is that the seal is a saltwater creature. And this seal is just lounging around 20 miles inland on the river, following the salmon. Very unusual. I'd seen them before, but never this far. It was almost to the Klekwan village. And... We saw it day after day for a couple of weeks. Only saw that once in 22 years. Which brings us to the largest creature of all, which I've already mentioned, and that is the whale. And we lived in a fjord. So literally we had the river, but we also had the ocean in the fjord between the mountains in our front yard. And yes... I saw humpback whales. Also, when on my trips down to Juneau, I saw humpback whales. Humpback whales are huge. And uh, one time I saw one breaching right next to the dock at Auk Bay. Just like coming up. And evidently this happens quite often if you hang out at Auk Bay long enough. Auk Bay is about uh, 20 miles from Juneau. He's right there now. He's coming up right here, dude. I've seen that kind of stuff. I've seen plenty of... I've taken the ferry back and forth to Juno. I've seen plenty of humpback whales. So, by the way, if you want to know how to see a humpback whale in the wild, let me give you the, uh, the technique. When you hear someone say, oh, there's a whale in the water, it's too late. 
because you may get there and you may just see a little bit of the whale. But if you really want to see the whale, you know what you have to look at? The water. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people seem to forget. They seem to think that the whole point of, of uh, seeing a whale is to, it's like you get this spectacular experience. But you know what? That doesn't really matter. What matters is that you appreciate the entire environment. I've seen a lot of whales because I'm looking at the water. I'm looking at the islands. I'm looking at the mountains. And then, oh, there's a whale. But but I remember at my first uh, ferry ride up to Alaska, there was this woman next to me who never saw a whale because she would only wait until someone said, there's a whale. And then she would get her, put her paper down, put her stuff down, get up, and go to the window, and it was gone. And on that same trip, I saw many. <laughs> you have to look at the water. And it's the same with all of these things. If you want to see animals, you have to pay attention to the forest and the rivers. You have to pay attention to the entire environment. Um, and you have to know something. You have to ask something. Uh, that movie, also book, Into the Wild, was also about the stupidity of people who want to have these experiences without knowing anything. They want a shortcut. They just want to go see nature. They want to experience it without doing any research, without, more crucially, talking to locals about what's what. Um, I lived in New York City for 16 years, then I moved to Alaska. One of the reasons I did it is because I knew in Alaska... I would meet people who knew a lot more about a lot of different things related to nature than I did. Just as I moved after 22 years in Alaska to here to Tbilisi, Georgia, because I knew I would meet people here who know so many different things that I don't know to keep my brain working. And finally, talking about whales, we'll mention the one that puts the fear in most people. And it's... Uh, the killer whale, or as we now more politely call it, the orca. And uh, actually we're talking about a big porpoise. <laughs> it's not in the same family as the humpback whale. It's not a baleen whale. It is a very large porpoise. Large, dangerous, intelligent creature. And in fact, there was one dolphin that swam up uh, to the uh, docks by Mud Bay. People went down there for most of a summer, about half a summer, and would go and play or feed the dolphin. And for some reason it was, we normally didn't get bottlenose dolphins there, but for some reason it was there. That was really fascinating. And I think it was intelligent enough to know, hey, if I hang around here, I'll get free food, which it did. And then there were a few people who even wanted to uh, swim with it, and it had a lot of marks on it. Some people thought it was either damaged from fighting animals, or it was damaged, it had escaped a confined somewhere uh, where it was uh, kept in a pen. Hard to say. One day, I was with my friend Bob Plucker. Bob Plucker had his sailboat called the Greta. And uh, he was... He had taught me how to uh, do some sailing, but I won't go into all of that. But we were on a day where the water was like glass. And it was April. So it was pretty cool outside as well. But it was late April when the hooligan were just starting to show up in the area. And as we were out there, um, I heard this sound. And I looked, and I saw a blowhole. Then I saw a huge fin come out of the water. And then I heard another one, and another one. And pretty soon the entire area in front of Haynes was filled with different sizes of black dorsal fins coming out of the water. And it was a pod of orcas on their way to the Lutak Inlet, where they were going to feed, <laughs> probably on those stellar sea lions. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's, that's why uh, the hooligan is so important, is because the hooligans bring the stellar sea lions and the... And the uh, Killer whales look at them and go like, now that's what I want. <laughs> but I actually took a few uh, eh, photos of them. 
but I don't have them here. They're in Alaska, which, by the way, you can help me uh, get my stuff from Alaska, but we'll talk about that soon in another video. And I was just absolutely blown away. Um, I have another photo here, which I'll show you. Uh, I'm showing you some images of killer whales here uh, in our area, but none of these I've taken. Uh, these are just normal. And one of the things that was often reported to me by friends was they would be out in a kayak. And they would be maybe doing something like going over to uh, Sea Lion Rock in a kayak on a nice calm day. You had to be careful because the weather could change very quickly. The wind could change quickly. But uh, one friend said she was out there and all of a sudden there was like a killer whale in the area. And what she had to do was go very slowly because if she splashed too much in the water with her paddles, the killer whale might go like, are you a sea lion? Generally, the killer whales were very cool about people. Generally. People who say they never attack people don't know what they're talking about. You know, they, they will, when they're hungry, they will eat. And they are big. They aren't as big as the humpback whale, but they can get to be, I don't know, what, 30 feet long, 10 meters long, something like that. That's a big animal. And, uh, yeah. So I felt, but I always felt blessed to have seen a pod of them at once. Uh, on their way to go see our first animal of this series of anecdotes, the hooligan fish. So that's it. I hope you found this interesting. Uh, there was no special, hidden, cryptic point about all of this, except to simply share with you stories about animals and to remind you, uh, you should go to a place. Don't, don't go to places where everything is done for you. Leave your phones at home. Go for a walk somewhere where you might run into animals, any kind of animal, small, big, it doesn't matter. Uh, learn about what's in your area or what's in the area you're going to visit. And uh, have some respect for them. Don't be stupid. Don't be simply a tourist around wild animals. Uh, get to know them. So this is Byrne saying, draw a beat. Temporarily. We will meet again. Um, meanwhile, before we do, uh, like, share, subscribe, the usual stuff. Leave a comment. What animals have you met that you have found Really, you know, what's your most interesting animal experience in the wild? You might allude this. Have you been to Alaska? Have you met animals in Alaska? Leave that experience. Um, um, yeah, you can contribute to the channel. There's a link down below, and it's much appreciated in these weird times for me. But hey, whatever. It doesn't matter. You're here. Glad you made it this far into the video. And uh, throw a beat. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.